The significance of the saints in the church is a cornerstone of faith. And the speaker expounds on this concept with unwavering conviction. He presents a compelling case for the validity and encouragement of prayer to the saints, drawing upon biblical references that provide the bedrock for this practice. By examining the role of intercession, the speaker invites us to consider the saints as conduits of divine grace, connecting us with the heavenly realm. Through scriptural insights and personal experiences, he unveils the profound impact that the saints can have on our spiritual lives. Our beloved fathers, deacons, monks, nuns, and our beloved congregation, those who are with us here in this holy church and those who are watching us for live streaming, may the almighty Jesus Christ of Nazareth bless you, guide you, protect you, and deliver you from the snares of the enemy, whether it be visible or invisible. Today we have the um, feast of St. Adde and St. Daniel. Um, these are church fathers that we remember and commemorate uh, throughout the church's calendar. At certain dates in the year we uh, have also commemorations of the saints. Being an apostolic church, um, this is something of profound importance in every apostolic uh, church and every apostolic teachings these are the um, teachings of our church fathers who have handed it over to those generations that came thereafter and of course the only way they would have done this is because this is the way they received it from the master himself jesus christ of nazareth when the lord jesus honors the saints we need to do the same and if you wish to understand the saints, Psalm 15, I recommend for everyone to read. Psalm 15. Obviously, there are plenty of biblical verses regarding the saints. So, Saint Adde in the Church of the East, more so, is extremely an important figure and a saint in the church. He was the one who was actually chosen by the Lord Jesus. And in the Church of the East tradition, we also, some church fathers claim that he was one of the 12 apostles. Some say he was of the 70th, but do, some say also of the 12 apostles. Regardless, he was chosen by the Lord Jesus himself and sent him to a country called Urhei, which later on became known as Edessa or Adusia. And that is in the land of Turkey, Iraq current times. Um, after the fall of the Assyrian Babylonian Empire, this country remained where the king named Abgar Okama was ruling in that part of the world and the entire inhabitants of that country all, were all of Assyrian descent. Uh, when he came to uh, the realization there is a great teacher that has come in Israel and he is called also the king of the Jews. Being a king himself, Abgar Okama, realizing that the Israelite people are actually rejecting this king of the Jews called Jesus Christ of Nazareth, he writes a letter and sends it with two of his delegates to the Lord Jesus, seeking his mercy, seeking his healing powers, and also asking him to come and join him in his own country since his own people are rejecting him. It was the last week of the Passion. So the Lord was about to embrace the cross. His time is almost coming to an end on earth at least. The Lord writes a letter with his own hands and he sends it with his disciple at day. Now, this sinner received the name of Mary. Now, Mary was the disciple of at day. And Mary was of the 70th disciples chosen by the Lord. So this name that has been received on this sinner goes all the way to the first century. All the way to the first century. So Adday takes the letter, Saint Adday takes the letter of the Lord to Abgar Okama, to a country called Urhei, where the Roman Emperor changed it 
afterwards, after the Roman Empire ruled in that region, he changed that name to his daughter's name, Adusia, and later on became Adessa. It's still currently present in Turkey. But the original name is Urhay, Urhay, the city of God. It's an Aramaic Syriac name. Aramaic Syriac name. Abgar Okamalu, by the looks of it, he had a skin cancer, some sort of an illness that was leading him to death. So he heard Jesus is healing. A lot of people, he's doing wonders and miracles. He believed without seeing, without experiencing it for himself. He said, you come, you be, you're a king, I'm a king, let's share the throne. My country is your country, you're a king as well, my throne is your throne. But I'm begging you, I've got an illness that has taken me to the grave. I've heard a lot about you, come and heal me, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. The Lord writes a letter, sends it with his disciple at day, and the Lord saying to him, if you believe in me, uh, then you need to be baptized and the entire country. He believes, he baptizes at the hands of Saint Adde and the entire country receives Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Saint Adde prayed on Abgar Okama, he was healed on the spot in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. When the delegates of King Ad Abgar Okama were sent to, to Israel to meet the Lord Jesus, one of them was an artist, a painter. He was trying frantically to paint the Lord Jesus with no prevail. The Lord realized their intentions, they were good. So he was trying frantically to paint him, he couldn't. The Lord takes a piece of cloth, wipes it on his face. His face imprints on that piece of cloth and he says, take this with you to your king. In the tradition of the Church of the East, where I come from, we are supposed to have what we called the Mendelian of Urhay or the Shroud of Urhay. You know, like we have the Shroud of Torin, so this is the shroud of Urhe. Instead of just a cross, we need to have the face of Christ in the heart of the cross, vividly clear. This is the faith of the Church of the East. So to every Assyrian person or every person who belongs to the Church of the East, if they say to you, we, we don't have icons or we don't believe in icons in the church, well, read the history of your church thoroughly, my dear friend. Yes, we do believe there has to be an icon of the Lord vividly clear in the heart of the altar. So iconography is apostolic faith. Archaeology, when they uncover those churches that have been buried underground, all the churches going back to the early first, second century, they all had icons, mosaic floors, all of them had iconographies, all of them, all of them. What, they didn't know what they're doing? They just received it from the master himself. They just received this faith from the master himself. So if icons are wrong, well, who taught them? The Lord. You can't have a fresh record as the first century apostles. So if they're wrong, we're in deep trouble. So that's Saint that day for you in a nutshell. May his prayers, along with Saint Daniel, be with us all and lead us to the way, the truth, and the life, the Savior and the Redeemer of the world, Jesus Christ, the Almighty God revealed in the flesh. Don't ever mix between the Lord and the saints. It's very simple. It's very simple. The Lord came to establish a family. How can you eliminate this family of the Lord? He is the Holy of Holies. He's got holy, holy children. Are you going to say, we love you, but we deny your children? What kind of a love is this? What kind of a love is this? So you go to the parents and say, you know what? I love you, but I don't care about your kids. In fact, I don't acknowledge your children. They will kick you out of the house. Because you disrespect the children, you disrespect the parents. You disrespect the saints, you're disrespecting the Lord. And don't differentiate. When I say, Saint Adde, I need you to pray for me. You need to go back to the Greek text and seek and search for the word prayer 
in Greek. In Greek, it has five different meanings. You see, the issue with some people, they read the Holy Bible in English, they read the Holy Bible in Chinese, they read the Holy Bible in Arabic, and they say, look, it says prayer is only meant to be for God. You're forgetting the, the New Testament, go back to the Greek language. You will realize the word prayer in English is only one word, but in Greek is five, and it has five different meanings. See, hello. So next time when you read, don't rush. You need to seek the original text, my dear friend. When you pray to the Lord, that is worship. When you pray to the saints, that is asking, begging, supplication, intercession, not worship. We only worship Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We only worship the Lord. The saints are His children. We ask their intercession to help us get to the Lord, who is the only Savior, the only Redeemer, and by the way, the only Mediator. I don't know what I'm, I was going to talk about the Gospel. Please allow me. When you read the epistle of St. Paul, 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 to 5. 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 to 5. Verse 1, St. Paul, he says, My brethren, I beseech you to pray for one another, intercede for one another. Verse 1. Verse 5, But there is only one mediator between God and man, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. There is only one mediator between God and man, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. So St. Paul himself begins his epistle to his disciple Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. He begins it with, I beg you, brethren, to intercede for one another, but there is only one mediator between God and man. So we see there is the word intercession and there is the word mediation. Totally different. Mediation applies to Christ and Christ alone. Intercession, he says, brethren, intercede for one another. Now I'll ask you, I'll leave you with this because I need to go to the gospel, right? Logically speaking, don't you go to someone who lives on earth in the flesh and you say, my dear brother, my dear friend, can you please pray for me? Don't you ask? Don't you ask people to pray for you? Do you or not? Yes. Excuse me. How come it is okay to ask someone who is still living on earth in the flesh, susceptible to sin? A sinner full of sins and he can make a sin any minute before they blink their eyes how come when you're asking for their prayers you're not saying this is a form of worship prayer is only meant to be for God anybody home you just ask them pray for me but hang on didn't you say prayer is only meant to be for God and if you ask someone to pray for you then that you've made that person God well how come now it is not God Yet that person is a sinner. But then it's not okay to ask a true saint, not a sinner. <laughs> it's not okay to ask a true saint to pray for you. Where is the logic? So you're asking someone living in the flesh, sinning every day, pray for me. But someone like Saint Edde, Saint George, Saint Nicholas, Saint Charbel, no, 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 no. That's wrong. Don't ask. They're dead. Excuse me. Who is dead? Them or you? <laughs> what is the wages of sin? Romans 6.23 The wages of sin is death. As long as you live in the flesh, we're sinners. The wages of sin is death. You're asking a dead person to pray for you, but you don't want to ask the living one in paradise to pray for you. Where is the logic without going theologically, biblically, and the rest? By the way, check in the church YouTube channel, Christ the Good Shepherd YouTube channel, type in intercession of saints. We've given you more than 50 biblical reference that intercession of saints is biblical. Over 50. I can give you another 50. Come back tomorrow and try again. Now, the gospel of today. Listen, a police. I beg you, I not only believe what I know, 
saints are living. It's not such thing as that, please. please. I'll take you to the desert one day. And I'll <laughs> saints are always with us. Now, it's Mother's Day today. So we all, all the mothers and all the fathers and all of us, we say to the Holy Mother, Happy Mother's Day, Mom. You are the crown of our glory. You are the true mother. You are the only mother. We love you. We adore you. We bow before you. And I kiss, I'm not worthy to kiss your holy feet, Mother, but I believe and I know you love me so much because your son, who is God revealed in the flesh, the Logos, the Word incarnate, he is your son. Theotokos, Christotokos, it is all the same. Your beloved son, who is God revealed in the flesh, gave you to be our mother. And therefore, we all say to the Almighty God, thank you, Lord, for giving us Mary to be our mother. And mother, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you for giving us your son, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, God revealed in the flesh to be the savior and the redeemer of the world. Thank you, mother. Thank you for being you. Thank you for being so loyal. Thank you for being so faithful. Thank you for enduring all the suffering and the pain to give us Christ the King, to be our King, our God, our Lord and Savior. Mother, happy Mother's Day. You are the love of my life. I love you. I adore you. I kiss your holy feet, yet I'm the unworthy one. But I will not let go of you, and I will always beg you, Mother, take me with you to your beloved son. You know the way, so take me to him. And just like you were so faithful and loyal on earth, the Lord has given you today a, a place that surpasses the saints and the angelic orders put together. You surpass all the saints and the angels of heaven because of your loyalty, your faithfulness. Mother, you are a school we go to learn from. You are our leading example. We look up to you and learn from you. We learn humility. We learn faithfulness. We learn holiness. We learn sacrifice. We learn kindness. We learn silence. We learn the way to sanctity, the way to holiness. You teach us how to be true followers of Christ. Thank you, Mother. Happy Mother's Day from the bottom of my heart to your beautiful, holy heart, Mother. Amen. Uh, this is the Lord. He adores his mom. Uh, by the way, if it wasn't for my sweetheart, Mother, I wouldn't be standing here. Literally, I'm saying physically, yeah? So if anybody comes and says, oh, no, no, they're not here, they're all dead. Excuse me, like, uh, are you going to tell me I, I, I didn't know who I saw, who I experienced? Not in a dream, not in a vision, not real, real. Real life, yeah? Real life. My mom came to my rescue. But who sent her? His son, her son. Because she can't do anything without her son. She never did anything without her son on earth, let alone now while she is in paradise enjoying the presence of her son. If on earth she didn't go against him, do you think she'll go against him now? Impossible. So she came because her son sent her. Anyone comes and says, the Holy Mother is gone now, her role is finished. You're finished, I'm finished. She came literally, delivered me from the mouth of Satan, chopped him. Chopped him with one finger. Oh, she is powerful. You know, you call saints sometimes. They're all powerful, by the way. But you call them, uh, it's not working. Mate. Call mom. Yeah. Mom, please, I'm stuck. Okay, I'm coming. You know what? Like, let the, lead, let the Lord lead you. Please don't be stubborn, don't be fanatic. No, 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 no. Have a fish bag and a chocolate. No, no, I won't. But relax, let the Lord lead you. 
Let the Lord show you. Don't be narrow-minded. Just say, Lord, you show me whatever you want to show me. Oh, the Lord will say, go and respect my mom. Oh, he will definitely say that. There is not one saint, not one saint, true saint I'm talking about, huh? not anyone, no. There is not one saint that became a saint unless the Holy Mother had some sort of a hand in it. Impossible for any saint to go to the Lord without having an encounter with the Holy Mother. Impossible. Now this I'll stamp seal it. All of them. All of them. Had an encounter with the Holy Mother. Because you see like, you're not going to go to paradise and then get a shock. No, the Lord will say, I'll give you a taste of what you're going to encounter in paradise. Okay, so you're going to taste some saints, not all of them, some things, because they're plenty. They're like the stars of heaven, you can't count. They're that many. But he will give you a few saints, 100%. Oh, there's this one. Don't tell no one, okay? There is this one goes back all the way to the third century. He came the other day, Habibi. Third century. Stunning. Stunning. Still alive. Powerful. Still alive. He can't tell me there is no saint. Let alone the Holy Mother. Get a life. With love and respect. Get a life. And next time you talk about my mom, you better think a hundred million times before you talk in front of me. Because if you say anything this way or that way, I'll chop you. I'll chop you. I'll chop you our way. Yeah, not like red belt karate. No, no, that's, um, that's for the um, fake governments of this world. <laughs> um, but I will chop you our way. So don't, don't, cross, uh, don't cross the line, my dear friend. Believe you me. I pray when, when the spirit leaves the body after a long life, may God bless you all and give you a long life. I can assure you, I can assure you 100% when the spirit leaves the body and by the grace of God, you make it to paradise, then you'll remember this good old bishop, what he was saying. You're going to get the shock of your life. If you thought that there was no saints, they're all dead. You're going to say, whoa, what's going on? Look at this holy place full of saints living, praying, praying for all of us. That's guaranteed. 100%. Go there. And when you come back, uh, I'll, I'll ask you, what did you see? <laughs> living. In a nutshell, the gospel of today is from the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the last chapter, chapter 21. Chapter 21 talks about the Lord revealing himself to his disciples after resurrection the third time. So after rising from the dead, the third time. See, the Lord revealed himself to the apostles and some other faithfuls 10 times after resurrection. He remained on earth for 40 days. And in those 40 days, he revealed himself to the apostles and other faithfuls 10 times. In this gospel of today, it's the third time he's revealing himself. Where at the Sea of Galilee, the, the very place where he chose them in the very beginning of his ministry to be the fishers of men. However, what happened here when he sees them at the Sea of Galilee, the Holy Bible says, and there was Simon Peter, Thomas the twin, Bartholomew, the two sons of Zebedee and other disciples. Wow, look at the order. Simon Peter, Thomas, Bartholomew, sons of Zebedee, the two of them, and then other disciples. They were trying to catch fish all night long with no prevail. The Lord yelled at them from the shores of the Sea of Galilee, and he called them, children, have you any fish? They said, no. We tried all night long, we caught not even one. He said, cast your net, at the right hand of the boat and you will catch and the net was filled with fish once they cast that net to the right of the boat they saw this they were blown away by this miracle john the beloved called out and said it is the lord because no one can do this kind of a miracle except him i've lived with him for so many years 
I know the style of my Lord. It is the Lord. Simon was semi-naked. He put on some clothes and jumps into the water, swims. He didn't wait for the boat to come back to the shores. He swam to the Lord. As they come out, they see the Lord sitting at the shores. There's fire on. There is an, a, a beautiful fish being cooked on that fire. The Lord says, grab some fish from the ones you caught. They caught 153 big fish. 153. But I want to talk to you about how do we follow the Lord and why do we stumble along the way when we follow the Lord. With these names, we learn Simon Peter, Thomas, Bartholomew, and two sons of Zebedee and other disciples. Who is Simon Peter? Well, Simon Peter, we realize how he got the name Peter in Matthew 16. And when you read from verses 16 to 18, the Lord asked his disciples, says, who am I to you? I, the son of man. Simon says, you are Jesus Christ, son of the living God. The Lord replies to him and says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. It was not the, uh, the flesh and bones that revealed this to you, but my father who art in heaven. Therefore, your name from this moment onward shall be Peter, not Simon anymore. Who is Bartholomew? Nathanael or Nathaniel. One of the 12 apostles of Christ. But here was not called by his name. He was called by his father's name. Bar in Syriac Aramaic means son. Bar Tholomew. His dad's name was Tholomew. And he is the son of Tholomew. Bar, so Bar Tholomew means the son of Tholomew. But the Holy Bible didn't call him by his name Nathaniel or Nathanael. So there was Simon. Peter, Thomas, Bartholomew. Simon represents the intellect. Bartholomew represents the heart. Between the heart, between the heart and the intellect, someone came into the line called Thomas. And Thomas represents suspicion. Because Thomas said, when the Lord revealed himself in that upper room, the first time, Thomas was not there. So when the Lord left, Thomas came, the other disciple said to Thomas, the Lord appeared right before their, our own eyes here. He is risen. He said, na, 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 unless I see, unless I touch, I will not believe. He got suspicious. The Lord came back again and revealed himself in that upper room the second time. And this time the Lord made sure that Thomas the suspicious was there. He said, come, now you see, touch, now you touch, digo. This is the Assyrian way, Digo. Intellect, heart. You see, the distance between the intellect and the heart is extremely short, but it is the most difficult distance to bridge together. The most difficult distance to bridge together between the intellect and the heart. Why? Because intellect speaks the language of logic. The heart speaks the language of feelings and emotions. Logic is the intellect. The heart is feelings and emotions. I'll put it in a very simple way. We drive cars. We'll take that the heart is the engine, is the motor of that car. The intellect is the brakes in that car. You see, let's say you take the brakes out of the car. Can you drive it? No, even if you have a V8, mate. The HSV, the good old days with the barbecue at the front bone. No matter how powerful the engine is, you take the brakes out, you cannot drive the car without brakes, definitely you'll have an accident. You put the best brakes in the car and you take the motor out. You can't drive. You see, the engine pushes, the brake stops. The heart pushes, but the intellect hits on the brakes. When you, as a girl, 
or as a boy, meet a girl and you meet a guy, what happened? The first thing happens, the heart ticks. See that the motor is turned on. Whoa, <laughs> whoa, who was that? Oh, definitely that was a V12, mate. So when you see her, you say, I'm a V24. I'm a Formula One now. <laughs> the engine revs to the red and wants to fly. After marriage, <laughs> you hit on the brakes and you say, what have I done to myself? <laughs> when the engine goes, that's your feelings and emotions. You see, when the heart ticks, you have no control any longer. The brain is definitely idle. If you just walk with your heart without your intellect, very dangerous, an engine without brakes, <laughs> you'll make an accident. And if you use your head all the time with no feelings and emotions along the way, you can't get anywhere. You'll always say, shall I, shall I not? What if? You'll make everything pitch black. It's like that young man went to the priest, seeking the priest advice. He said, Father, I have known this girl for four years now, and I came to ask you, shall I marry her or not? The father kicked him so hard outside of the place. Why? He said, if you've been with her four years, why are you asking me? Am I marrying her or you? Use your head and get on with your life. But you see, he's been hitting on the brakes. I don't know. If you use your head all the time, You'll always be stopping all the time. You are not progressing. You're not going forward because there is that element of what if, fear. But when it's the heart only, you're blind. My daughter, this guy is not for you. Don't marry him. Mom, dad, you have no idea what you're saying. You don't know nothing. I know everything. But my daughter, trust us, we are using our head. We're looking at him. He looks kind of dangerous. He's not for you. The daughter is driving with no brakes. When suspicion comes in, Thomas resembles suspicion, faith is driven out. When faith is driven out, it is impossible to bring the intellect and the heart into unity. Impossible. So what will happen in that person when suspicion enters any one of us? We struggle. There is a war. There is a battlefield inside of us. There is a, bat there is a war happening. I am unsettled. I can't decide on nothing. I don't know where my head is and my feet are. I don't know what direction, where to go, who to see. I have no idea. I'm lost. I'm confused. There is a very difficult battle happening inside of me and I am lost. Father, please help me. Well, you see, because you've allowed suspicion come in. Why do you have doubts in me? I, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Haven't I said to you, apostles, I will be handed over to the authorities and the high priest. They will sentence me to death. I will be crucified. I'll be buried, but I will rise from the dead on the third day. Did I or did I not say this to you? I was only three days ago. How easy do you forget? How quickly do you forget? Oh Lord, you know why? It's not that we forgot, but we found ourselves in a very stressful time. We found ourselves in a very difficult situation. We lost it. You see, Simon Peter and all of the apostles, all together, equally, they were ordinary people like everyone else, meaning, they knew their life's routine day in, day out. Simon, he knew exactly what to do every day. He would get up early in the morning, go and prepare the nets, take the boat to the sea and cast and, co and catch fish, sell some and buy food and cook some, eat, come back home, say hello honey, hello my children, because he was married, <laughs> right? So that was his routine life. He was 
known to live this way. This is all he knew. Out of nowhere, suddenly, this person appears in his life and the other disciples. This person is called Jesus Christ of Nazareth. All glory to his holy name. He comes to Simon, he said, you are a fisherman, I'm gonna make you a fisher of a uh, man. You catch fish, I'm gonna teach you on how to catch men for the kingdom of God. So he follows Jesus Christ of Nazareth. When he follows Jesus Christ, his life in its entirety changes. In its totality changes, including his name changes from Simon to Peter. He became a totally different person. Why? Because when you give your life to Christ, Christ is known to change you wholeheartedly. And if Christ doesn't change you, then he is not God. Because it takes God to change the heart of men. It takes God. That's why, what is the ultimate miracle God does in every human's life? Not raising him from the dead. No, changing their hearts. You see, Lazarus, who was dead for four days and rotted in the grave, the Lord raised him from the dead. This, to some, may say it's the ultimate miracle anyone could do in their life, raising the dead. But my dear friend, did you, and did you know that Lazarus, whom Christ raised from the dead in Bethany, Israel, he's got another grave in Cyprus, Lanika. He's got another grave. So the, the Lazarus who was raised by Jesus Christ himself died again. But when the Lord changed Lazarus' heart, Lazarus lives forever, never dies. When the heart is changed, you live forever. So the Lord changed the disciples' lives altogether. They got used to him one month, one year, two, three, three years and four months. Three years and four months, they got used to him. Now they said, okay, we've hit the jackpot. We found the Messiah. Man, the Messiah gives us everything. We're gonna live like kings as long as we're with him. We say we're hungry, he gives us food. We're thirsty, he gives us water. He does wonders, miracles, raises the dead. No one can touch us. He is God revealed in the flesh. He will save us, protect us from anything and everything, including spiritual realm and physical realm put together. That's it. We don't need anything else once we found the Messiah. As they were contemplating on this, the Messiah is crucified. The Messiah is put into the tomb. The Messiah is dead. You know what? They got the biggest shock of their entire life from hero to zero, just like that. Simon got up the following day. He was used to seeing the Lord. He would run to him every morning. Good morning, Lord. And bowing before him, kissing his feet and the Lord hugging him, kissing him and then spoiling him. He was used to this. He was used to the Lord every single day of his life. He said, I am changed. When Jesus died before their eyes and placed in the tomb in the flesh. Now Simon became neither Simon nor Peter. He said, if I go back to the old Simon, I cannot. He changed me. This Jesus came, chose me, changed me and left me. He destroyed me. To go back to the old Simon, the married man with wife and children and fi catching fish, I can't go back because when Jesus changes you, you can't go back to that old person. That old person is dead. It's dead. Now to be Peter, Peter cannot be Peter unless he is with Christ. Because the one who made me Peter was Christ. But Christ is gone, I can't see him. I can't be now neither Peter nor Simon. So what do I do? I'm gonna call the other miserable disciples like me. Guys, let's go fishing, hoping a wave will come and take us down under. We wanna die. Disappointment leads to suicidal attempts. Disappointment. They got disappointed in Jesus for a moment. So they went to die, not to fish. What fishing? I'm destroyed. What fishing? You know when you hit rock bottom, 
would you go out and have fun? No, you want to go and revenge. Some people take it on themselves. Some people take it on others. They're revenging out of frustration, anger, disappointment. All night long. But the Lord won't leave him. In the morning he was standing there. You see, when we, all of us, when we go through hard times, and we get to a stage we are about to lose it, <laughs> like totally give up, losing hope, before you give up on the last breath, Christ will embrace you and revive you, bring you alive. He will renew you as if nothing's happened. Without a scratch, without a blemish. Just like they were giving up, they want to die. Christ appeared. You know what he called them? Children or little kids. But Lord, they're grown-ups. This guy is married. He's older than you in age. He said, yeah, but they're acting like kids. So they are little kids, very childish, just like the world. <laughs> are you not, you're not laughing? <laughs> okay. You know, when all those big calibers came and said, Corona's coming, that was childish. When they say pandemic, that was childish. When they say vaccine, that was childish. Adults acting like little kids. So what do you call them? <laughs> little kids, children. What are you playing with? What are you doing? Have you got any fish? No, of course you're not going to catch fish because you've gone and left me, I, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You see, without me, you cannot do anything. Haven't you heard me say this? Without me, you cannot do anything. You're going on your own. Where are you going? Come back. Come back. I'm here waiting. You go out to the world, that is the sea. And where, where did they go to the world, the sea? They were all night long trying to catch something. The moment you go into the world, you are at night. The world is darkness. And what does the world give you? Absolutely nothing. If you think you chase the world, in the hope of gaining something, the world will laugh at you at the end and will give you one thing, the grave. And when we go down the pit, we take absolutely nothing with us. Nothing. This is the world. At the beginning, laughs in our face. At the end, laughs at our face. In the beginning, come, let's go. Let's do this. Let's do that. Let's buy this. Let's break this. Let's kill this guy. Let's destroy this person. Step on this man. Steal. Destroy. Sell white powder. Do this. Do that. Give him the pill. Shred him to pieces. Come on, man. You're powerful. You need to be known. You need to be heard. You need to be seen. You need to be exalted. You need to be elevated. Put fear in everyone's heart. When they see you next time, they bow before you out of fear. Make sure they all need you. Let them beg for your mercy. Be powerful. Divide and conquer. And at the end, that guy who was the most powerful is old. He is in a nursing home. The nurse walks in, puts that plate in front of that man. He can't even eat. He can't do nothing. Wow, wow. The world is laughing at you now. The Lord is faithful. The Lord is truthful. He never laughs at no one. He says, follow me. You need to carry my cross. They will persecute you. The world will hate you for my sake's name. But rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in the heavens. I never lied to no one. I never bluffed or deceived no one. I said it from the beginning, walk through the narrow door. You're going to feel a lot of pain, but remember, I'm with you all your life and until the end of all ages, I am with you. And every time you try to lose hope, you'll see me standing at the shores of the Sea of Galilee and calling out, little child, 
Have you got any fish? No. When they came out to the shores, they saw there was already a fish caught and cooked. Who caught that fish? The Lord himself. That one fish, what does it represent? The 12 apostles. The Lord says, I caught you. You are this fish in order for you to go and catch the world for me. The 153 fishes the disciples caught, but the one fish that was already on fire at the shores, Jesus caught. And that fish is the 12 apostles. He said, I'm going to catch you. You're going to go and catch the world for me. 153. It's three different numbers, not 153 as one number. No, it was a hundred and a 50 and a three hundred. The perfect result produce 50 Holy Spirit, three Trinity. When you get a hundred out of a hundred, that is the perfect result. The perfect fruits 50. It's a long story. When you read in Luke chapter 16, that that evil steward the Lord entrusted his possession with this steward with the servant and then the servant came to him that tomorrow your master wants to see you and you need to give an account on everything you've done he got scared so he went to one to cut it short he said how much does my master uh, how much do you owe my master he said a hundred liters of oil he said right 50 now oil represents here the Holy Spirit. What happened 50? What is 50? Pentecost. What happened on Pentecost the 50th day? The Holy Spirit descended on the 120 people who were sitting in the upper room. The Lord Jesus says, when I catch you, when I fill you with my Holy Spirit, when the Holy Trinity works in you, your result will be 100 out of 100. Three, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. 50, Baptism, the sacrament of baptism, you're being anointed by the Holy Spirit to be born into Christ. And when you are born into Christ, Father, Son, Holy Spirit will work in you. When the Trinity works in you through baptism, you will get a hundred out of a hundred. What is a hundred? Perfect. The Lord said, be perfect like your heavenly Father is perfect. To enter God's kingdom, you need a hundred out of a hundred. Perfection. So you want to get to heaven? Yes. Then how do I get to heaven, Lord? He said, you need to have me in your heart through the Holy Baptism. You need to let the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit work in you through the Holy Trinity. By the sacrament of the baptism, your results will be a hundred out of a hundred. This is the 153 fish which you caught because I caught you first. And then I sent you to catch the world for me. Very quickly, Mama, happy Mother's Day. Fathers, you'll have to wait for your turn. <laughs> I just want to say one thing about Mother. God revealed Himself as the parents. Every time you pray, you say, Our Father who art in heaven. In the book of Isaiah, the Lord Himself says, If the mother forgets to breastfeed her babe I will not forgive you I will not forget you says the Lord so the Lord reveals himself as the mother in Isaiah and as the father in Matthew and Luke the Lord's prayer the ultimate ranks are the father and the mother parenthood for God is family God is family God is father son Holy Spirit when does the man become a father when he has a child has a son so God reveals himself, I am naturally family. That's why he instituted marriage as the first thing ever to exist on the face of this planet was marriage. And look what they do in here, desacralizing marriage. Shame on such lost generation. Desacralizing marriage. Yet if you touch anyone's race, they will get offended. I just want to ask, where did this race come from if it wasn't for marriage? Would the race have ever existed if there was no marriage in the first place? Who brought race into existence? Marriage. How come you're making race sacred and you are desacralizing marriage? Where is the fairness here? 
And everyone, even the atheist, knows very well they didn't come out of Adam and Steve. They came out of Adam and Eve. So mom, remain a female and be proud to call yourself a female. For God, the Almighty, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one in nature, one in essence, chose for you to be a female. And what God has given you, don't ever try to change. Forever. Mother, it's the most, it's the sweetest name, mother. Sometimes you want to run to mom more than dad. Why? Because dad is the brakes of the car. Mom is the engine of the car. Mom is the feelings and the emotions. Dad is kind of boring, logic. You go to dad, you talk for hours, dad will say, okay, one word. And if you continue more, he says, son, daughter, enough, I've got a headache, go to your mom. Don't bother me. You go to mom, the heart of the mother, so big, so wide, so deep, so intimate, so loving, so caring, so ticking. Hello, my baby. What's wrong with you, Habibi? Come and sit. Let us talk. And you tell your life story to mom. She's all ease. She's listening. She's got all the pressure of the world on her, but she still makes time for her child. We're talking about the genuine mother. Genuine mother. Mother that is all sacrifice. That is all loving and caring. A mother that is all tease. Saint Augustine, who was a fourth century saint, but prior to becoming a saint, he was one of the greatest sinners the world had ever seen. The greatest sinners. From the greatest sinners to the greatest of saints in the heaven of Christ. How did this child be saved and delivered? It was the tease of his earthly mother that saved him. You talk about intercession? There is no intercession? Oh yes, there is. For 38 years, St. Augustine lived a life of sin. With women. Lived a life of sin with women. He knew endless women. Every single day for 38 years, the eyes of his earthly mom never stopped crying for her son. Begging the Lord Jesus, the good shepherd, please, my Lord, bring my lost son back to you. 38 years, tears never stopped gushing down from this mother's heart, then her eyes. After 38 years, one day he wakes up, St. Augustine. Changed. Just like that. 38 years back. This woman came knocking at the door. Augustine, where are you? He said, what do you want? She heard his voice. She knows his voice very well, more than her voice. She said, Augustine, come on, open the door. He said, Augustine is not here. She said, come on, stop playing and joking with me. I know you very well and I recognize your voice. Please stop playing around. Get up and open the door. He said, no, the Augustine you knew once upon a time, today is dead. The one who's talking to you is the new Augustine, raised from the dead by the tears of the heart of his mom. Mom, mom, mother. Wow, wow. Do you realize, mother, who you are and what you are in the eyes of God? You represent Him. God showed Himself and revealed Himself as the mother and the father. Father in protection, mother in provision. Mother provides, dad protects. The man builds a house, the woman gives him a home. The man brings groceries, 
The woman gives him a food and meal on the table. The man, you're my daughters. The man gives her a seat. The woman gives him a human being. Wow. Wow. Amazing. How this mother gives and gives abundantly and plentifully. I beg you, every mom that is listening, if you have little children, raise them in the love of Christ. Bring them to church, whether they cry, whether they run around, break, do whatever, bring them to church. From the age of nappies, bring them to church. Make time for your children because they need you, mother. Dad is busy working, but you're raising a family for God with the help of the man. In Arabic, I'll say it in Arabic. الأم مدرسة إذا أعددتها أعددت شعبا طيب الأعراق. Mother is a school. The mother is a school. If you prepare her, you would have prepared a nation of great values, principles, and dignity. Mother is a school. If you prepare her well, she will raise a generation that will sh shake the whole world. That will give children who are going to be the reason to change societies forever. But we need to prepare this mother who is the school to raise such warriors for God. Happy Mother's Day. Remember, God adores you, mother. God sees himself in you, mother. For he is the mother, the provider. He says, please, my daughter, resemble me on earth. Let me reflect my image and light in you, through you, by you, towards the whole family. One thing I will ask of you, mother, take it easy on your husband. <laughs> he operates with logic. Uh -huh. So if when you go and you want to talk to him and the timing is so imperfect, <laughs> he's gone at that particular time where you wish to open up and speak with him, he's gone into his empty box. You see, the brain of the man is made out of so many boxes. But all the boxes are not linked together. They are all separate. There is one box that is available in the man's head that is absent in the woman's. It's called the empty box. The empty box, the signs when he's gone into that empty box is when he goes and sit on that couch and stretches his legs and turns on the TV or a video game and start playing, ignoring you. You are washing dishes and cleaning and cooking in the kitchen. He's gone silent. It is that time when you want to start nagging, nagging, nagging him. Are you blind? Are you stupid? Are you idiot? Can't you see? I'm, I'm tired. I'm working like you. Get up, get up, you lazy man. The man looks. Oh. goes back to that empty box <laughs> you keep on pressing the button he will jump from the empty box to another one called volcano <laughs> women are amazing their brain is made out of so many boxes but the problem they are all linked together so when you ask a man, since the boxes are not linked, when you ask the man, how was your day? Yeah, all right. You ask the woman, how was your day? <laughs> you will never hear the end of it. 
she will tell you the intrigue details of the details. This morning at 7.45 a.m., I got up and I had a bad dream. All I asked, how was your day? And then I got to work and this guy got on my nerves. And then by lunchtime, I've had enough. After lunchtime, I said, I'm going to kill someone. But then I remembered you, my hubby. I said, I better kill him. So I came back to kill you. That was just to make you laugh a bit. Mother, happy Mother's Day. God bless you. God keep you. God protect you. God enlighten you. God give you the wisdom to discern what is his will in your life, mother. And all the mothers and all of us, we say to our holy mother Mary, happy Mother's Day, for you are the true mother that we will have in the next life forever and ever and evermore. Amen. God bless you. Let us bow our heads now and ask for the Lord's forgiveness while we recite this prayer of solution. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our good God and full of mercy, our good God and full of mercy, whose grace and mercy is poured upon all. Pour, my Lord, the compassion of the delightfulness of your love upon your servants, and again transform them in the hope of renewal to the life of repentance. Renew in them your Holy Spirit, by whom they are sealed for the day of salvation. Purify them by your compassion from all flesh and spiritual blemishes and assure the hope of their faith by the aid of your grace and instill the works of their behavior in the paths of righteousness. Please them along with the saints in your kingdom by the assurance of the hope of their faith in the adoption as your children and in the joy of your absolving mysteries. Empower them by the aid of your mercies to observe your commandments and fulfill your will, to confess, worship, and praise your holy name, the Lord of all, Father and Son and Holy Spirit forever. Amen. The sermon concludes with a call to faith and trust in the power of the saints, encouraging believers to seek their guidance and support on their spiritual journey.